How's it going? Um, welcome to week two. You made it. Um, hopefully week one wasn't too bad for you. Uh, there are a bunch of you, speaking of week one, that still need to finish your listening bracket syllabus and tell me what your final project is. The final project is in this week's um, uh, folder. I moved it out so it was easier to find. Um, but if you did not do the syllabus or the listening bracket, you need to make sure to go back to last week's um, uh, folder. Okay? So this week, um, listening bracket. Last week, the uh, um, uh, winner was, well, you guys can find that. I put the uh, brackets in each of the uh, um, folders underneath the listening bracket too. Um, it was different for each orchestra. It was interesting. Two went with one way and one went a different way. It'll be interesting to see who wins at the end on what different um, classes taste is. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to do an overall because as soon as we have a divert division, it doesn't make, it doesn't allow for it. So anyway, um, this week's listening is going to be Haydn and Mozart. So Franz Josef Haydn, he was a composer in the classical era. Uh, he was the teacher of both Mozart and Beethoven. He's known as the father of the string quartet and father of the symphony. Um, he wrote 104 symphonies, and the symphony we're going to listen to is um, Farewell Symphony. It's number 45, so about eh, a little less than halfway through his uh, symphony uh, repertoire. Um, it is a piece that solves a problem. So the problem was that um, he was employed by a prince, Prince Esterhazy, and Prince Esterhazy liked to travel. He liked music. He had a court orchestra. And Haydn's gig was actually pretty good. He was the composer and conductor. He got to, basically, he had any resources he wanted to work with as far as instrumentation, he had the opportunity to because Esther has a, had a pretty, pretty, pretty big orchestra for the day. And um, Esther Hazy decided to go to his summer home. And unfortunately, it was smaller than his main residence. So therefore, all the musicians and servants' families couldn't come. But he took all his musicians because he enjoyed music. And back then they didn't have, um, well, YouTube. So he had to bring them along live. And so they all went and he said he'd be back by whatever date it was. And he was having so much fun up at his summer home, he decided to stay a little longer. And stay a little longer. And he kept pushing back the day he was going to go back. And the servants and the musicians were a little bit um, peeved with this. And so they hadn't seen their family for however long and Count Esther or Duke or Prince Esterhazy was uh, kept, kept pushing everything back and it was being longer and longer and they were getting, they were missing their families. So they came to Papa Haydn and uh, they s explained their problems and Haydn thought about it and he didn't figure he had enough uh, clout and he appreciated having a job. Uh, so he didn't go directly to the prince and um, he thought about it a little longer and came up with a solution. So he composed a symphony, number 45, and um, he started off great. It first three movements were are fairly normal, typical, if you will. Um, it's a great piece. If you want to go listen to it, um, just YouTube uh, Haydn 45, Symphony 45, otherwise you'll get String Quartet 45. Um, and then the fourth movement starts, and it starts off really normal. It's a, if I remember correctly, it's a rondo. And really fast, peppy, and it's a cool piece, which is the fourth movement's one you're going to listen to. And it gets to the end, and it cadences, and then it keeps going. Slow. And in the music, Haydn wrote in each part. For example, I can't remember what order it is, but the timpani player. Blow out your stand light. They had candles, so that way they could read music. And leave stage. So gets the performance, and the timpani player blows out his candles and leave stage. Next thing the audience knows, the trumpet players do the same thing and just walk off stage. This is not normal. And then the oboe players do. And then the rest of the wind and brass players do. And then half the strings. And then eventually we're left with just a string quartet at the end of a symphony. This makes no sense. And then the viola and cello leave stage. And we're left with the two violins playing. And they come to an end and they blow out their lights and leave stage. 
And apparently the Prince Esterhazy figured out what Haydn was saying, and uh, very shortly thereafter they went home. So it was a musical solution to a uh, real-world problem. Anyway, that reminds me, uh, do you know why the string quartet couldn't find their composer? He was Haydn. Anyway, on to Mozart. So Mozart was a child prodigy, as most people who've heard the word, or heard of Mozart know. Um, he, did it, he made his first composition before the age of five. His first symphony was written at the age of eight, and his first opera was written at the age of ten. Um, the name of that one is Bestiana Bestiana. It's, I've actually played it. I was the rehearsal pianist for a college production of it, and I got to watch it, and I think I actually played violin too. Um, cool piece. Um, it's got a um, case of mistaken identity. It's got a love triangle. It's got magic. It's got a magician. I think it's only got three characters, if I remember correctly. I can't remember. Uh, it's been 15 years. Anyway, um, well, maybe a little less than that. Whatever. Um, but that was, that's Mozart. You can find a lot of information on Mozart. He's probably one of the most famous composers ever. Um, he wrote Symphony Number no. 23, the one we're going to listen to. Um, he wrote it as a single, uninterrupted movement, but it's got three tempo changes that are normal. It's fast, slow, and then fast. So it's got three movements. It's just they go straight through. There's no break like normal between a movement, just a short break. Um, it's a cool piece. It's only 10 minutes long, which is short for a symphony. So I'll, so while the Haydn, you just listen to the last movement, this one, you're going to listen to the entire symphony. Um, so at the end, after you've listened to the two, make sure to put into the listening bracket, um, which one you liked and why, and then that'll be your assignment for this week. Okay. So on to the practice section part of this um, video. So if you go to Schoology and you look right under the meeting links, there is a link to something that says Cora Cooper flowchart flow session practicing. And if you click on that, it opens up a flowchart. And it is this is to help you practice. So at the top it says practicing, what to do when it doesn't sound like you want, to, want it to, which is kind of the reason we practice, right? It doesn't sound like we want it to, so we practice to make it better so it sounds more like what we want it. And so it starts off with two options. I don't know why and I know why. So if you don't know why, record yourself and listen really carefully. Try to listen, like make, I don't know, two or three recordings at least and listen to them and see what it is that you are missing, okay? And see if you can find it. And if, once you do, well, okay, if you can't, send a recording to me and I can help you out there. If you can, if you suddenly, you can figure it out. Um, she has six um, basically broad uh, categories of things that typically go wrong. Not too many things fall outside these six categories. So the first one is it's not fast enough. Second one, it's out of tune. Um, I don't know the rhythm. It's inconsistent. Tone is poor or co coordination is poor. So um, the one I'm going to focus on today is it's out of tune because that's the one that is the most likely to, um, well, it's the most obvious one that most people have problems with. So that's the one I'm going to start with. So if we go down there, it says, first, listen. So play it through and listen really, really carefully. See if you can adjust, make sure your fingers are moving as you play. So move, small move, movements, so that way you make fine adjustments. Um, next one is use a drone. So like I talked with scales last week in the, uh, warm-up section of it use a drone so i'm gonna do any or give you an example of what that would look like let me move all this up so i'm going to use the same piece as i used last week the um, bot concerto and it starts off in e major so i'm going to put a drone on e so there's e and then i'm going to play just the beginning i'm going to listen really carefully and i'm going to try to tune everything to that so it starts on E and I wasn't in tune. That was out of tune. There it is, there's the G sharp.
okay? So doing it really slow and listening really, really carefully to a drone as you're playing. Another thing that even might be even more helpful than that is her next suggestion is one note plus one beat of rest at 50 beats per second, or per minute, sorry, beats per minute, not second. You don't want to do that fast. Um, and uh, play, let's see, and use no rhythm. So if I set my metronome to 50, sorry, I should have had that done first. There we go. So one note, one, one beat. And then one, or one note, one beat of rest, and then one note at a time. Here we go. Okay, so notice there was no rhythm. It didn't sound anything like what the rhythm is, the It didn't sound anything like that. Um, but it was a slow one note and then the next rhythm, next beat's a rest. And then next note, so that way you can have time, your brain has time to analyze where's my next finger go? Um, is it a shift issue? Is it I, it's an extended third finger. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, gives you a little bit of time to uh, work on that. Our next suggestion is play the arpeggio and the scale in that key. So I'm in E major. she says later on is watch out for finger patterns like be aware of your finger patterns and for me E major is an extended third finger a high third G sharp as well as on the A string a high third um, D sharp so I have to remember there's a whole step between each of my fingers there's the half step and there's the half step okay um, and then the arpeggio Um, if you need, just Google, uh, whatever scale you're in, whatever key you're in, and then arpeggio and scale, and I'm sure you can find, um, fingering charts for yourself. Um, if you don't remember, if you have one of the habits books or you have something like that, I'm sure it's in there too. Well, actually I know it is. Um, let's see, ringtones and resonance. So what I've talked in class about third finger ring. So playing third finger and you should hear your open strings ring, or fourth finger and the ring, string above it should ring. Okay, you should be able to actually see the strings vibrating as well. And just listening for that and watching for it is something that can help you with that. Um, then if that gets better, great, keep going. If it's not, um, she says, examine the shifts. So for me, like that opening shift is, it's a nasty one. I'm inconsistent with it. So that's a different problem, but I know where it is, but I'm just inconsistent. Okay. Um, but finding out if it's a shift that's causing your intonation problem or if not, some of you, it might, some of you, it might, if you're not shifting, it's probably not a problem. Um, look at the finger patterns. Like I said, for me, E major has that high third finger that can sometimes be flat or tends to be flat. Um, another issue is sometimes if you're playing in C major or in G major on the A string, it should be a low two, it should be a C natural, and you're not used to the second finger being low or using your second finger if you're cello or a bass. Um, making sure that that finger pattern you're recognizing and you know what you're doing, okay? Um, look at the left hand tension. So sometimes tension and clamping down can cause your um, hand to be uh, out of tune. So okay, that went really, really badly, right? Obviously it was a lot of extra weight from here, but it was also a case of my fingers didn't have the ability to adjust. I was so tense that once they went down, they weren't moving. So making sure your fingers are only pushing down on the string is enough that they can 
or only enough to stop the string and prevent or make the pitch. It shouldn't be any lo any more than that. It should just be fairly light, actually. Okay. Um, if you're pushing too hard, your fingers won't be able to move and adjust. And so if you make a wrong note or slightly out of tune note, you won't be able to slide it into tune and it'll sound really bad. So make sure it's light enough that you can still move your finger just a little bit. Um, another, another thing, suggestion she has is sing the tune. So dum, bum, bum, da da dum, da da dum, bum, bum, ba da dum. And the more you sing it, the more it's called audiation. So you can hear how it goes because you can make it with your voice. And then the more you can anticipate it with your mind, you can hear it better in your head. I know it sounds weird, but you can hear it in your head. You're more likely to make it right on your instrument. Um, and then play an octave lower. So if you're playing something that's way high in position, um, well, that's a bad example. Um, so, and you're not obviously that one everybody knows, so you can play it up there. But um, if well, have fun. But I don't expect you to. It's all right. Um, you you recognize the melody, but let's say it was something up there that you were having trouble with. So, the D. Um, so I'm gonna put it down in first position so I can hear it better. So I'm just gonna take, okay, that's a D. Okay, I'm gonna start on D. That one way up there is the, okay, so. So I can hear it better down an octave and then And I can hear, I can put it up there now that I understand what it's supposed to be saying. It's kind of like singing in the tune, it's just putting it down an octave, okay? Um, check your tone production, that kind of along with that tension one that I did. It's really bad, it's tone production, it's also a bow issue. It's tension over here, but a tension here too. So that would go over to the tone one on the left orange squares. And then check your strings. Make sure your strings are in tune. First thing you should do before you play is double check your intonation or your strings and being in tune. Use a tuner. Um, and then all these problems, your foundation's at least in tune. So you can listen for that third finger ring and you know it's in tune. That's why, that's why I tune you every day when we were in class, okay? Um, and then the last thing she has there is listen. And if it still doesn't get better, Again, shoot me a recording of it, and I'd be more than happy to take a look at it for you too. Okay, so that is the flowchart. And if you wanted to, if you have any questions about anything else on the flowchart, I will get to them eventually. But before I get to them, if you have a question about, I know I'm having a problem with speeding it up. Um, how do I do this? Shoot me an email or a message, and I'd be more than happy to do it. So, okay, that's it for this week. We'll see you around. Bye.